Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Monroe Live. I'm Julian Ates. I'm one of the associate engineers here at Monroe and Associates. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, 2020 Tesla Model X battery pack. Uh, before we get into the details, uh, for those of you who are new to the channel or are new to Monroe and Associates uh, as a whole, uh, we're an engineering consulting firm. We specialize in uh, competitive benchmarking, uh, cost analysis, and uh, uh, cost reduction uh, exercises. So. Um, Within that framework, uh, one of the projects we've recently completed for a client uh, included the teardown and analysis of a series of uh, electric uh, vehicle battery packs, uh, specifically from uh, Tesla vehicles, either Model 3s, Model Ys, or in this case, we do have some non-plaid, uh, one non-plaid Model S and then three Model Xs. We're going to be looking at one of the more intact uh, Model X battery packs today. This is from a 2020 model year vehicle. Um, mainly, we just wanted to talk about this uh, at sort of a high level and go into some of the design choices here because we haven't had one in the building to tear down uh, outside of uh, this project, which we got in very recently. And there are quite a few differences between both what we see uh, across different Tesla vehicles as well as just different uh, uh, battery packs from o different OEMs as a whole. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and uh, step over here and just talk at, at a very high level uh, detail here. Uh, this is a 100 kilowatt hour version of this pack. There are 16 modules uh, which are comprised of 18650 form factor uh, cylindrical cells. Uh, so there are 16 modules total in this pack with the 75 kilowatt hour variant having 14. The two modules stacked on top of one another in this front compartment being absent from that 70, uh, 75 kilowatt hour variant. So they're physically decontenting the pack here in order to accommodate those different uh, capacities. However, in the past, they have done uh, software limiting. So they've had common packs and then simply uh, use the software in the vehicle to limit the available range, and then you can later purchase an upgrade. Uh, they've discontinued that, uh, again, as was present for this 2020 model year uh, version. However, recently it's been confirmed that they are moving back to that uh, sort of a setup. So we're now going to be seeing common battery packs for uh, both, uh, both capacities, the standard and extended ranges with a presumably uh, option to purchase a range upgrade if you uh, initially got that lower, uh, lower capacity battery pack. This episode of Monroe Live is brought to you by Joa. Joa is the world's leading provider of Tesla accessories. Brought to you by a team with over 15 years of experience engineering highly specialized accessories for automobiles, power charging, and lifestyle. Joa can provide what you need to keep your Tesla organized. The center console organizer adapts the storage space to easily accommodate sunglasses, Tesla key cards, charging adapters, or whatever you need to store. The silicone material is designed to prevent items from sliding or rattling and makes this organizer easily washable. Joa also provides an armrest organizer, ensuring a neat and tidy rear compartment. For even more storage options, try out Joa's underseat collapsible organizer. This organizer is exclusively designed to fit the Model Y underseat space. The storage box can be easily folded and expanded, making it versatile for use in your home, garage, or anywhere space is limited. Complete your Tesla organization with one of Joa's custom car fragrances, designed to easily attach to the front fence of any Tesla, and seamlessly integrates with the minimalist interior. Choose from multiple scents, including forest breeze, morning dew, and refreshing grove, all scents are created using pure natural extracts and plant-based essential oils. Created for Tesla owners, by Tesla owners, these products are developed by the Joa team to enhance your Tesla driving experience. View the entire catalog of Joa products at joalife.com. And for a limited time, use code MONROEJOA for 5% off your order. Um. One immediate thing that sticks out, we do have a uh, Model Y battery pack right next to this Model X. And uh, one thing that sticks out is both the sheer size. Uh, you can see even, uh, Grace, if you come over on the side here, uh, looking at it from the side, you can see that it's a much longer pack uh, in general, uh, and it's got a little bit more width to it. So um, this is uh, a little bit beefier. Uh, and then construction wise, one of the things that is also immediately evident is that where the Model Y and the Model 3 battery packs utilize aluminum stampings, this is very uh, extrusion intensive. Uh, so this is something that we've seen Tesla sort of trend away from both 
with the Model 3 and Model Y packs and also with the structural Model Y pack with the 4680 cells and the structural foam. Uh, we do see with other OEMs, uh, Ford, uh, Lucid, um, you know, various others, we do see extrusions be sort of the go-to for uh, getting into the, the battery pack um, uh, design, usually for the first few iterations while it's refined. The tooling for extrusions relative to stampings is fairly inexpensive and it's uh, not uh, as difficult. Uh, the, the tooling isn't as uh, dead set. Uh, so iterative changes to extrusion profiles are much more accommodating when you're trying to uh, dial in what you uh, want your design to be. Uh, it's also, there's a volume uh, uh, aspect there too. The Model X and the Model S are uh, fairly low volume when you compare that to the Model 3 and the Model Y. Um, so that's just a few things that are, uh, that are driving the differences in what we're seeing in terms of the pack construction here. But again, a uh, fair amount of aluminum extrusions, um, stamped steel cover, and we don't have the cover here. Uh, but we'll have some photos that uh, Grace can throw up onto the video here for us. But this is a, a stamp steel cover uh, with a uh, penthouse to uh, cover those modules. So again, uh, relative to what we see with the Model Y, where we have all of our power distribution unit, the onboard charger, DC-DC converter, all in that penthouse. Here we're using it strictly just to accommodate um, uh, additional modules inside the pack. Um, but with that uh, lid, there's also something that's unique just across any of the, the BEV packs that we've looked at, and that's uh, essentially what would cover the main area on top of the, the pack here, on top of the lid, is a, a plastic sheet that has a liquid applied bead around the perimeter to help uh, seal, um, uh, keep uh, uh, the fasteners from uh, corroding. There's also uh, what is presumably a uh, um, sound deadener or uh, some kind of a die cut sheet underneath uh, that plastic sheet to uh, presumably help with oil canning between the, um, uh, the, the battery pack and the floor pan of the vehicle. Uh, however, with the removal of the lid, uh, there are more fasteners uh, just to remove the lid than uh, we typically see. However, once it's removed, you can see that there is a uh, very uh, deliberate reason for that. And that is, uh, once that's removed, what we see here is exactly what the inside of the pack looks like. There are no discrete fasteners intra-pack that are used to facilitate the anchoring of the battery modules into uh, the pack tray. So essentially they are set in and uh, only finally completely clamped down into their final position once the lid is installed. So that has several benefits. Um, for one, it means that uh, you can uh, have fasteners be multi-use, uh, which ultimately should uh, allow you to eliminate some of them. Uh, the other main advantage to that is relative to other battery packs we've torn down, uh, such as the Lucid, where uh, to get the bus bars removed and take the modules out, uh, there are uh, tool access points through the extrusions on the sides of the pack, and you need to remove fasteners, uh, drive them off of the bus bars, and there's a risk of either dropping them down below the modules where there's a potential to short or making contact between the bus bar and the battery pack chassis. In here, you don't have any concerns uh, for any free floating fasteners where you have all of your current collectors and all of your uh, bus bars and uh, high voltage uh, potential there. Uh, so that in and of itself is something that's uh, both uh, an assembly aid, but also it's a, it's a safety uh, thing as well. You don't have to worry about having free floating fasteners inside here once you have all of these modules bust together to the 400 nominal uh, voltage for the pack. Um, so just uh, another uh, aspect of that. If we move up toward the front, uh, we can, or I'm sorry, the rear, uh, we can see that um, one of the main differences between this pack and uh, any of the others that I'd like to speak to is uh, you can see that we have, uh, this had a cover removed. This is for the power distribution unit. So in a Model Y or Model 3, what would normally be inside the penthouse, just sands the onboard charger and DC-DC converter. All of those components would be uh, uh, vehicle side on this, uh, on this vehicle. These two connectors for the low voltage and the high voltage you can see are directed uh, upward in Z. And we can see likewise at the front of the vehicle, we have our coolant connections uh, that allows the flow of ethylene glycol into and out of the pack through all the plumbing and our aluminum micro extrusions that flow through the modules. 
This has been moved slightly from teardown. However, this is also gonna be aimed directly upward in Z. And this pack, uh, one of the primary design philosophies into it was it was initially designed for pack swapping. So in about 2013, uh, Tesla had a pack swapping event where they were effectively advertising for this uh, specific pack, which is uh, gonna be more or less common between the Model S and X. Uh, the thinking at the time was uh, as a way to mitigate range anxiety, uh, since we didn't have uh, as much infrastructure for supercharging at the time, was to have pack swap stations. And they demonstrated that roughly in the time it took somebody to fill up a tank of gas with an ICE vehicle, they could pull into a station, the pack would automatically uh, have you know, a robot undo all the fasteners, undeck the battery pack, and replace it with a new fully charged one. And so these uh, Z-axis uh, essentially quick connects for both the coolant and the low and high voltage electrical connections uh, were part of what were used to facilitate that. Now, obviously we've seen uh, recently that the trend has been more toward improving supercharging and infrastructure for charging rather than just swapping entire battery packs economically. It ended up not being the, uh, the most optimal way to go uh, for mitigating that range anxiety. But it is still interesting that even in vehicles as, uh, as late as 2020 and presumably uh, even past those model years, um, 2020 is the most recent version of this pack we have seen internally. However, it is interesting to see that there are still aspects of that pack swapping that are still present in this pack, even though uh, largely uh, that uh, whole infrastructural uh, uh, ambition was uh, largely abandoned by Tesla and others. Uh, from a servicing perspective, though, uh, this specific uh, project for the client involved 10 uh, high voltage battery packs needing to be removed from the, the vehicle and analyzed. Uh, and then outside of this project alone, uh, I have removed over a dozen other uh, high voltage battery packs from vehicles for various other projects. One of the main things with these is that they, they were an absolute treat to uh, remove from the vehicle. It's everything is done from the underside. So again, lending to that pack swap station, nothing cabin side needs to be affected. Uh, so no uh, carpet needs to be removed, no trim no seats everything can be done strictly from the underside of the vehicle with a series of fasteners and then also uh, moving some air shields out of the way um, however uh, it's very very easy to remove this pack from the vehicle uh, i think we it, you know by the time we had done uh, three or got to the fourth of this specific type of pack it took 10 to 15 minutes only to uh, you know disconnect all the fasteners um, and you know remove it with our lift table so um, so while the quick or the pack swapping might not be what that's primarily used for, uh, servicing these is certainly going to be a lot easier than uh, a Model Y or even some others like a Lucid or what we'll be talking about in a few weeks here. Uh, we've also taken a look at a Porsche Taycan and that had its own uh, set of considerations for the pack removal. So um, uh, definitely like that aspect of this design. Uh, however, uh, we didn't take too much of a peek at uh, what it meant for everything body side. So if we have chance, Maybe we'll do a deeper dive in that uh, at some point in the future. But just from a pack perspective, it does make things uh, very, um, very efficient. Um, a few uh, other things just in terms of the pack. Uh, so sort of speaking to what we were just talking about. So this is actually from one of the others, and this is the uh, contactor and high voltage terminal assembly. So this is what we just saw at the back of the pack. Uh, can be removed as its own subassembly with some low voltage connections to the BMS board. Uh, so there are two blade terminals that stick down from the body that will interface with uh, these, uh, these uh, female receptacles here. And then you have your sets of contactors inside of this as well. And uh, so this is all, this is a fairly, uh, you know, tight package and it just sets right down uh, inside that front or that, that area at the rear of the pack uh, where we're gonna store all of our power distribution unit components. So uh, something like this, again, uh, relative to if you've seen any of our teardown uh, videos from uh, any of the Model 3s or the Model Ys, this is pretty compact compared to what all of that equipment looks like in those vehicles. Something else that was uh, unique to this pack is the uh, pyrotechnic fuse. Uh, we do see these Fairly commonly in battery packs, uh, none of them look quite like this. Um, uh, we had this located right, uh, you can see these two uh, bus bars with an open circuit here, and then 
a cutout in the tray below it. So this was located right there, and that is the mid-pack point. And uh, this has a service access panel from the underside of the battery pack to remove it. And one thing that we noticed while looking at it, and this was uh, just more of a, um, just a, something because of the way that we see them now where they have uh, the low voltage sensor uh, connected there and then it's uh, again it's a much different enclosure here but here we can actually see if we get right close in there there are actually much smaller cylindrical lithium ion batteries so this actually has its own power supply with its own dedicated uh, two, uh, two battery cells mounted right to that PCBA on the underside so uh, it's unclear to us at present exactly uh, how this is uh, performing its uh, sensing and actuation. However, given the fact that it is battery powered and not receiving power from the high voltage system, uh, presumably, or uh, is uh, being actuated specifically from that, uh, that low voltage connector, uh, this in theory would need to be replaced if those batteries uh, died at any point just as a, a serviceable component. So. Um, that was uh, an interesting takeaway because this is definitely unlike uh, pyrotechnic fuse we've seen in uh, any other battery packs that we've torn down. Um, so a few final closing points. I want to go a little uh, deeper into the module architecture we have here. Um, so uh, the modules in this pack are approximately uh, six kilowatt hours, uh, give or take. Uh, from the original versions, they actually had fewer cells in each module and uh, have since for the uh, newer uh, iterations added, um, uh, added some cells to what the initial capacity was. So they're a little bit larger in this model year version. Um, and uh, what we can see as an interesting trend between the two of them, and we do have some B-roll of the older version of this as it relates to uh, the thermal management system, uh, but we've actually got, if we come over here, we can see uh, sort of what was a step change toward what we now see as the cooling strategy with the Model Ys, uh, uh, the Model 3s, and pretty much across the board. We saw it in the Model S Plaid. Uh, before there was uh, essentially a free-floating die-cut uh, thermal gap pad that was sandwiched between where the cylindrical cells were and where the cooling ribbon was, that micro-extruded aluminum channel uh, that's contoured in a serpentine profile to uh, fit the contours of the cells. And what we see with this version is they made a step change to closer what we uh, uh, see in Tesla's normally, which is the micro-extrusion uh, essentially directly along the edges of the cells with uh, some uh, presumably silicone-based uh, black uh, gap filler. And it's possible that this is mainly to uh, help in isolating the cells from one another, either electrically, if this is applied locally while they're doing quality checks and they see that there's maybe some uh, isolation issues between those cells. Uh, but what we can see here is if I... Uh, poke at this just a little, you can actually see that there is, uh, you can see the gap spreading between the cooling channel and the cell. So one main difference we have here in terms of how the thermal management's being executed is uh, typically we'll see these micro extrusions with a uh, sort of a yellowish, very thin layer of thermally conductive adhesive. And that is to help facilitate gap filling and maximum surface contact with the cells. Um, so here we don't see any of that, and we also see that these, relative to what we see with, uh, for example, the Model S Plaid, um, they're very shallow. They cover, you can see it comes down nearly to the base of the cell, but we're covering maybe only about half of the available surface area along this section of the contour of the cell. We have a vacant area up top, and what appears to be still some vacant area down bottom. So we also don't have as much surface area contact with these cells as we're seeing in uh, current versions. So uh, still, um, obviously from this, you can tell you know, that Tesla identified that they still had some progress to make from where we're at in this module to what we're seeing in more recent model year battery packs. Uh, however, it is interesting to see uh, sort of the evolution of uh, how they're making those uh, sort of step changes uh, from model year to model year, or even in some instances within the same model year uh, between, uh, between the same vehicle or different vehicles. Um, 
So ultimately, I think that covers about everything we wanted to discuss with these battery packs. Uh, we found this interesting. Uh, again, we haven't seen one of these in-house before, so it was definitely uh, you know, a, a cool learning experience to, to just have another uh, historical data point for uh, the evolution of Tesla's products and uh, seeing sort of uh, the origins of where some of the things we've observed in more recent vehicles started and what that iterative process looks like. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Um, if you are interested, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are an engineering consulting firm. We do vehicle teardowns, competitive benchmarking, uh, cost reduction ideation. And for any of the teardowns we've done on several other battery packs, such as the Rivian, the Model S Plaid, we also have done a uh, 4680 Model Y. We do have reports available for purchase on those vehicles. Uh, for just the battery pack or the whole vehicle. Uh, so if you have any interest in that whatsoever, you can feel free to reach out to sales at leandesign.com and we'll be able to set you up with anything you're interested in. So thanks again and uh, tune in next time.